Hey folks, welcome to the EMS Nation podcast. I'm your host, Faison Arshad. We are continuing along our series on pre-hospital ultrasound, and today we have two gurus, none other than Rachel Liu and Richard Andrew Taylor, who more commonly go by at Yale underscore EUS, as well as at EM underscore informatics on Twitter, discussing the potential of tablet ultrasound devices. So this is something we've seen with all technology, smaller, more potent, longer battery life, highly portable, and ultrasound is no exception to that general trend in technology development. That's very exciting for us though, because it certainly opens up new avenues for EMS POCUS use and the portability combined with high image quality resolution and uh, the ability also to select uh, the right probe for the right job is something that is very exciting. So we have Rachel Liu and Andrew Taylor here today to discuss the future applications as well as some of the limitations of ultrasound tablet devices. Today we feature three devices and uh, just so you guys know we have no commercial interest in any of these devices but are generally excited for the competition in the market space because it is something that will lead to better technology and folks are actually starting to listen now. We're talking to our representatives as well as some of the higher ups in the uh, tablet ultrasound sphere, they are very excited about the prospect of pre-hospital ultrasound and are actively listening to feedback from EMS medical directors and practitioners out there on how to optimize the device for our needs. So translating from the old school radiology ultrasounds to the slightly more portable uh, emergency department ultrasounds to now the new sphere of tablet ultrasonography. This is very exciting, so stand by and hope you enjoy this one from Rachel Liu and Andrew Taylor. I'm Rachel Liu, and this is Andrew Taylor. Um, we're both from Yale uh, Department of Emergency Medicine, and we both um, are faculty with the our emergency ultrasound section. And we're here to talk to you today about tablet ultrasounds. Um, we're streaming live from our course that we're uh, holding in Miami right now, so keep your eyes peeled for the Yale Caribbean course, um, probably in Miami next year too. Um, so we'll just talk about some of these things that we have uh, available today. I'll start with the GEV scan. So the GEV scan is this uh, little guy that looks like a, kind of a Star Trek tricorder, I guess, if anyone remembers those. and. Um, they started coming around on the market roughly around 2003, 2004 or so, um, and they've had several iterations of their product, and I think they're on their third, second or third edition right now. Um, this one is the oldest model. So it's got a flip top kind of um, thing. It has one probe that is a low frequency probe that can do um, cardiac, abdominal and OB applications. Um, and it's pretty simple to use. It's got a circular interface, kind of like the old iPods um, with uh, clicking buttons. Once it comes off here, I'll show you some of the um, settings. And then next we have the Terrason tablet. The Terrason is bigger. It's more of a laptop screen sized thing. And that came on the market around 2000, when? 2011 or so, 2012, um, is when I first started playing with it. Um, it's going to have more robust features than some of the smaller ones just because of the size, the CPU capabilities, um, and they may have different applications for use too. And then on this side, we have the, one of the newest models, which is the Philips Lumify. And this came on the market in December 2015. It's Android tablet based, so any Android can work with it, whether it's a smartphone um, or a tablet. It works with a app. Uh, 
I can't work upside down. <laughs> and so the app is called Lumify, and all the expensive stuff is in the Pro, not uh, on the tablet. So right now, they have a linear and curvilinear probe available, and they're working on a phase array. And then probably we should back up even from there and talk about like, how we integrating this stuff into you know in care. I think for a long time we've wanted to you know have devices that we don't have to wheel into the room. Uh, you know, it takes time. Nobody really wants to do those types of things, and so we've moved. You know, hopefully, we're moving away from large base machines into these types of uh, devices. Um, and I think all of these provide different characteristics uh, and particular reasons why you might want to choose one product over the other. But I think the basic concept is that we're getting smaller and smaller devices, more portability, uh, the ability you know, to hold it in your pocket or carry it with you. Um, and I think that has you know a wide range of applications. Um, first, you know it can move outside of the emergency department into primary care type settings. Um, used for remote settings, I think it's a huge application for these types of things. Um, and then you, even, you know, EMS settings, uh, pre-hospital care, uh, moving those things, allowing you know, people in the EMS world to be able to, to do these things uh, can be incredibly helpful. Um, can you talk about how we're using them now, actually? Yeah. So this one we've had the longest. Um, and right now, as our residents, or even ourselves, go internationally. Um, they're taking it with them to Liberia, Indonesia, um, South America, whenever we're doing our abroad trips. And it's great because, you know, you don't have to check it in. You can just throw it in a backpack. Um, you don't really have to worry about durability um, that much. Um, we even use it on an airplane going from Santiago to Valdivia, Chile, because one of the passengers right, got sick on the plane. <laughs> so that was kind of exciting for us. Um, these I have used a lot for um, educational purposes, so it kind of depends on what your setting has. We have cart-based machines, so we don't necessarily need our own personal ones of these, but I love that I can just throw it into a backpack, take it to me when I'm teaching on a ward, um, or you know, going to a hospitalist kind of clinic, um, some sort of non-hospital setting um, to use them with. And I've used it a lot for um, teaching courses and, and education purposes. And we have that same device on our physician response vehicle. So for EMS programs that deploy uh, physicians in the field, I think that's an excellent option. And that also has a USB capability. So we in fact able to connect a video laryngoscope, power that and record all the images because it's a computer with a CPU as well. Yeah. And then the, um, helicopter EMS systems are also using it and critical care transport. Yeah, so one of the coolest things I saw last year at uh, WinFocus 2015 that was in Boston was Luca Neri, who is an Italian physician who has a Terrason. It's Windows-based, and he was able to build a program that um, did tele-ultrasound. Hmm. So he was able to split a computer screen into four, have a camera um, on the ambulance so that they could see what the ambulance kind of uh, environment was, how the patient was, like how the patient looked in a car crash or whatever it is. Um, they had a camera inside the ambulance so that the command control could talk with the paramedic and see how the paramedic was scanning. Mm -hmm. They had another part of the screen that actually saw in real time what the paramedic was doing. And then the, in that last box was the command control uh, with the microphone. Awesome. So all parties, which is like in three different places, could talk to each other. And that was based off um, a Terrason because it was Windows Windows um, 10. So for EMS, uh, what are some potential applications for ultrasound pre-hospital? And can you transition that question and tell us a little bit about the prospective IRB that was recently approved? So uh, probably one of the biggest applications for EMS right now is um, undifferentiated shortness of breath, in um, especially the differentiation between CHF and COPD, because I think a lot of us have had many instances where um, you know EMS comes and says, hey, hey, this patient has a history of CHF, um, really short breath, we threw the BiPAP on, um, we gave you know X, Y, and Z, um, and it turns out that they had asthma or undiagnosed COPD or something else that didn't require those treatments. And likewise, on the flip side, you have, hey, this guy has 
big time COPD. We're just going to give epi, nebs, all these tachycardiac, you know, inducing things. And then you realize, hey, you know, they actually had CHF and what you thought was wheezing was actually rails or sometimes these guys don't even have discernible physical exam findings. So that's one of the huge areas in EMS that this would be helpful for. And actually that's the basis of this pretty large, robust study that we have planned and are trying to work on um, getting machines for. Um, it, you know, a lot of applications has actu have actually been described in EMS. So the Australian um, flight system have described um, ways of actually diverting MI care because the person they discovered a dissection or an aneurysm was the cause of the person's complaints. And so they were just about to give, you know, um, anticoagulants and that probably would have been a bad idea in this case. And then, you know, there's um, lots of uh, applications in nearly every um, ultrasound thing that you could do. So, Andrew, your expertise is dyspnea and echo. Do you think it's feasible to teach pre-hospital uh, uh, providers the rush exam, including basic echo, IVC, and fast exam? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's I think it's not something hard to learn. Um, obviously, it's going to require some resources and some people being involved in the teaching aspect of it. But I mean, I think you know if you really talk about looking at the rush exam um, and looking at these applications, it's really a kind of a limited set of the exams that you need to do, um, particularly for the cardiac application. You're really only going to be looking at a parasol and long axis, which is accessible with most people. Um, if you're talking about you know lung, looking at lung evaluations. It's really on a single anterior views that you really need to teach for people. So I don't you know I don't think we're asking a lot, and I think those things can be easily taught probably in, in a day session uh, for most people. So I think it's you can easily apply that to, to a lot of uh, you know potential pre pre kind of paramedic uh, settings, um, and then go from there. And uh, just to plant the seeds with folks who are watching on Periscope, Andrew, your lecture on dyspnea, we're going to live stream tomorrow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So Friday, stay tuned for that. Yeah, and Rachel, your lecture uh, using ultrasound in critical care settings and the five E's of echo, we're also going to live stream tomorrow too. Okay. Awesome. Great. Great. What are some of the limitations of tablet ultrasound devices? Screen, screen size would be, I mean, you're going to be... So I think we're all used to larger screen sizes now and be able to pick out small things. Um, you know, I can see some limitations with if you're going to do soft tissue evaluation, sometimes it can be particularly hard to pick up with abscesses and differentiate that from just examples of cellulitis. Um, so I, I mean, I think that's a, a clear uh, disadvantage for all of these things. Um, I, I think you're going to have probably some problems with image quality, but they're getting better and better and better and better. Um, you've definitely seen that over the time period. Um, and then I think from the average practitioner, probably cost is, is probably the, a major limitation just in adoption. So if you're you know, talking about widespread adoption of these technologies and having every primary care doctor have this and having you know, lots of pre, pre uh, hospital care, uh, people having these on board, um, I think the cost is gonna gotta come down uh, Right now, they're still pretty expensive. So um, this one's the newest one um, that has come out. Um, uh, I also have to mention that Sonosite also have their version called the IVIS, which we unfortunately don't have um, here today. But the image quality for this is actually quite good. I can scan my arm in a second. But um, the benefits of doing something like tablet ultrasound is, you know, you can have the touch screen capabilities that um, you know, any tablet has now, which a lot of the younger generation um, is used to. And really, the, the image quality is very good. Um, limitations are limitations of the tablet, not necessarily the ultrasound, you know, software. So, for instance, things like big time sun or hospital lighting can cause a glare, like how you can't, you know, read an iPad on the beach, probably the same kind of thing applies, um, despite matting, um, uh, what do you call those, screen protectors. And so let me just kind of show you um, how good it's gotten. Hey. Oh, this way they can, all right. 
Let me know if I'm blocking this, okay? <laughs> and let me you can you can tell me what I need to do with my like Can you see? Yeah. So this literally is just my wrist and I'm going up and down. And if I could, you know, these things have the cap capability to do color flow, Doppler. I'm unfortunately using both my hands, <laughs> so I can't do it right now. But, um, you know, you can find my radio artery. I can easily do a nerve block. Um, yeah, go, go ahead and do whatever you need to, because I can't see. Um, with something like this, and you know, if you had this on the patient's bedside, that takes up a very small footprint, mm -hmm. you know, more beneficial for us instead of having to work around the cart. Um, got it? Okay. Yeah, because I was messing around with it. And um, now, this might not be the most robust thing on earth. You know, it's, it's got two color flow Doppler settings, a high speed one and a low flow one but you know with these things what are you really looking for we're looking for things that can um, be pretty quick so I don't need all that robustness for this uh, I definitely think these are moving it's moving ultrasound into really a, like a physical exam so we you know starting to really think about ultrasound as that component of the physical exam and doing these like on the evaluation we had so might ask about even an evaluation for like pyelonephritis and flank pain. Um, you know, how often would you look and see that they don't have an obstructed stone if they, you know, otherwise aren't really presenting with you know symptoms of renal colic? And I think you know when you have these tablet type devices, um, the barriers to doing the ultrasound are reduced or if not you know eliminated. Um, and I think that's a huge advantage. It's just doing more ultrasound. And then if you finish looking at this one, we can show what it looks like on the Terrasan. Sure. Okay, so here's the same thing. So my radial artery is up on top. And yeah, you can see a little bit um, better because of the bigger screen. And it's hard to capture on that thing because you, you, know, you have to get nice, close and personal here. Um, the Terrasan is heavier, obviously, than a tablet. But um, again, it depends what you're looking for in a machine. So you want to push the color? No. Oh yeah. No. Oh. I think we have to change the. Yeah. That's probably good off a little. That's alright. Yeah. Oh, increase? you found my me my media nerve. <laughs> I'm wiggling my fingers and saying hi. <laughs> but you know. The image quality for these things is very good. And the so cardiac like on this device is incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have uh, three different generations. I guess all these machines are separated by a couple of years. What's the couple of years? What's the future of tablet ultrasound devices? And uh, folks on Periscope are asking, uh, what about uh, ultrasound display in my glasses or with the advent of Google contact lenses? <laughs> Will I be able to see <laughs> ultrasound images on my Google contacts? <laughs> I have not I, heard about well, context. Well, I have Google Glass. And you did have Google yeah, Glass. Yeah, Google Glass. you did. And I got to say, like, the image quality for the Google Glass, the way it was developed, isn't that great. So I'm not thinking that Google Contacts will be great until maybe another 20 years of development. But um, I, I definitely think that's the way people want to go, though, in the future, is they don't even want to have to carry around even a small base tablet having some kind of visualization uh, system that's you know already there um, and just have the probe itself and nothing else and it, you know, wirelessly communicates. I think that's where we're headed and I think a lot of other mediums and IT stuff will be delivered that way too. I think we're going to have you know, medical records and stuff that are going to come through these devices. So it seems like a natural marriage between those two things. Um, you're you know, able to see stuff. Plus, being if that being close to your eye, you know, the resolution and everything can be greatly enhanced and your ability to see a, a larger picture will uh, be improved that way. There have been demonstrations of um, kind of tablet or ultrasound machines going through Google Glass, um, specifically when doing like peripheral IV placements. Hmm. Um, if, if they are able to actually centralize the image and you don't have to keep looking up in the little right corner to look for your needle, then that might be better. 
um, Google contacts might be interesting, although it'd be weird seeing like an image in one eye and then you know, I think it would throw your depth perception off. That's true. But um, like future directions, definitely we need more in EMS. Um, having something like this mounted to inside an ambulance um, would be kind of awesome. I, I, I think yeah. another thing that needs to happen is to open up the platforms a little bit to allow some yeah. you know, development with the additional secondary apps and I think that will help with getting images in like in a free hospital setting, getting images to the appropriate places um, and using them in the future. In telemedicine, you're saying? Telemedicine. In tele um, and really, it would be pretty awesome if we could get something like this into every doctor or every med midwife in places that really need um, imaging. Low resource environments. Correct. Yeah. So, I mean, with these, it might be possible with the price points coming down and uh, the world needs that right now. Right. Well, thanks so much for your time, guys. I think uh, that was fantastic. Where can folks find you guys on Twitter? At Yale underscore EUS. It's Dr. Rachel Liu. And then um, I'm at uh, EM Informatics. EM underscore, underscore Informatics. That's Dr. Andrew Taylor. And last but not least, people are loving this. Can you tell them a little bit about the Yale ultrasound course and where they can next catch us in Newport, Rhode Island. So we're looking at a date, hopefully, of September 8th and 9th in Newport. Um, and we run that one every year. Um, hopefully this one continues to in some nice sunny place like Miami. So hopefully that's planned next year too. And uh, yeah, look for us on the web at us.yale.edu because that's where you'll find all our course information. Perfect. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you guys so much for listening to episode number 13 on the introduction to tablet ultrasound devices. We would love to hear your opinion and thoughts on whether you think this tech, with its increased portability, has potential future applications in your clinical practice. Please tweet us at EMS underscore nation. And find us on Facebook at www.facebook.com backslash Prehospital Nation. This is Faison Arshad wishing everyone a very safe tour.